Hey gang, we're in Evergreen Park, Illinois, just on the southwest side of the Chicago area. We're at a cemetery called St. Mary's Catholic Archdiocese Cemetery. I want to give a shout out to Nancy Pryor, who gave me the lead on this story. Apparently, the woman that we're going to be visiting her grave, young woman, well, her name's Margie Stern. I think Nancy went to high school with her, and she obviously knew her, so this was a very personal story. Margie was murdered back in the 70s, along with another girl in another suburb by the same man. So let's walk to her grave and I will tell you the story. It was in Oswego, Illinois, which is south of here, pretty far south of here, southwest if you will. And it was September, September 27th of 1973. There was a girl, her name was Roberta, her nickname Bobby, R Roberta Bobby Joe Anderson. She was a sophomore at Oswego High School. And on a fateful day, that fateful day, she was last seen leaving the farmhouse of a friend. She had about a quarter of a mile to walk to get back to her home and she disappeared. That was the last time anyone saw her. Her body was discovered, sadly, just a few days later and she had more than 60 stab wounds. She was left at an abandoned farm and that would be the end of that because no one could figure out who did it and it turned into a cold case. Now about five years later we're gonna go north. We're gonna go north to a suburb called Glen Ellen. Now Glen Ellen is far west Chicago, far west of here it was September 15th of 1978, and that's when 18-year-old Margaret Stern went by the name Margie. Margie was a part-time clerk at the College of DuPage there in Glen Ellen, and she had told a co-worker, she said, I'm not feeling too well, and I'm going to go home. I've got to go home. Okay. She went home. She lived in Woodridge, which is just next door, the next suburb over practically, and she would usually walk the whole way. It was about seven miles. It was a long walk, or she would take a cab. Now, there would be a little bit of a pattern here because apparently as she would hitchhike, she must have hitchhiked a ride. Well, on this day, Margie who was wearing her platform shoes may have decided that the easiest way to go would be just to, to hitch a ride. Now someone claimed that a girl fitting Margie's description climbed into a burgundy van. The eyewitness said that it had gold painted, a gold painted wing on its side and that person was the last person to see Margie alive. Well, I should say the second from the last person because the last person to see her alive was the killer. Well, many years passed. Nobody knew what happened to Margie. They searched and searched missing persons. They took all the typical investigative approaches and they just couldn't find her. The police tried. Well, it was almost eight years later on May 9th of 1986 there were these two rock hunters hunting for rocks, looking down, walking along and they were at an abandoned farm. 
not just any abandoned farm, but it would turn out to be the abandoned farm where Margie's body would be found. It was located just north of Boughton Road in a suburb south of here called Bolingbrook. Not that close. So things were getting kind of, you know, things were kind of spread out. It all didn't happen in one place. They did find a skeleton and it, the, the one easy way to identify and know it was Margie before they really did the autopsy was her platform shoes were with her, buried. Well, I don't know, she wasn't buried, she was like, it was like a shallow covering. You know, that's the one thing, they weren't, weren't buried. And I say they because Bobby Joe Anderson's body was found at that same place back in 1973. So let's just think about this for a second. Time out in the story. Let's, let's put some pieces together. We've got Roberta killed, she's there, and then five years later, Margie is killed, and she's there 30 feet away from Roberta, right? Same place. So you have to wonder, going back five years, when he killed Roberta, it had to be big news in the media. He, he may have even been a suspect at the time. But what does he do when he kills Margie? He goes and he puts her in the exact same spot, practically. Now, he, he's either really brilliant or really stupid. I vote the latter, but the police didn't know. They didn't, police didn't go back. It took the rock hunters, right? It took the rock hunters to find her. So, really strange. So all in all, justice would have to wait almost 20 years to start its gears into motion because there would be a break. And that break would come on December 4th, 1990, when they finally arrested a suspect. His name? Major Morris. He was living in the tiny town of Dixon, Missouri at the time, way down there, way southwest of St. Louis, way out in the sticks. You know, where no one would ever find him. Living anonymously, a family man, loved by all. Interestingly, he had moved there from the general area of the murders literally days after Roberta initially disappeared in 73. Now, Patricia Morris, his wife, <laughs> His wife of 24 years, can you imagine? Poor Patricia. She called him a loving man, a gentle man, and a father whose two daughters absolutely loved. Of course. Later, his defense attorney, you have gotta love the defense attorney sometimes. Well, they're doing their job, right? He said, he was nothing short of a perfect gentleman who has lived a law-abiding life for the last 20 years. Well, he was right. But what about before that? You want to comment on that, Mr. Attorney? <laughs> Didn't say anything. When they went to Dixon, they went with a court order. He was a suspect. He had been a suspect. 
but you know DNA was coming along, sciences, and they went to take some blood samples from him. It's part of the investigation. And get this, lo and behold, even though he was not charged with the crime, he like broke down. Well, I don't know that he broke down. He basically, he basically got scared because, you know, the death penalty is looming. This is before our governor, George Ryan, who was indicted and put to jail, said as a lasting, you know, legacy for him, I'm just going to let all the people on death row, you know, we're going to commute that. But anyway, not to get off on that tangent, he like broke down and he got, he got scared and he goes, he literally said to them, he goes, what if I confess? And the investigator looked at him and he said, what? He goes, yeah, what, what if I just confess to this? And they were perplexed and they had to think for a minute. And then they said, well, you can do that. I, I can't guarantee anything, but let's, let's talk about this. So he ended up spilling his guts on the crime. To the investigators, he did, I think, what was a 30-minute or a 20-minute or a 30-minute video confession. Right on the video camera. No lawyer, no nothing. Well, he was next charged with Margie's slain. And after the authorities said he discussed the killing with a fellow prisoner. Loose lips sink ships, let me tell you, they just can't help themselves. They just can't help themselves. And again, he ended up capitulating because of that. You know, this is back before Governor Ryan with the death sentence. So they had him on both. Now, what's really interesting about this case is there was a case of a woman, Julie Ann Hansen. We did an episode on her. They really thought that he did it. Another girl that was taken and, and murdered, she was left in a cornfield, you know, general area. And they matched his DNA and he didn't match. And it turned out that it was that creep, that old man creep from Minnesota. They got him. I'll put the link up for that one, which I literally did that episode the day after it was announced. But anyway. So they, they did have him for Roberta. They did have him for Margie. He was sentenced to 100 years on January 2nd, 97. And of course he would get another 20 years based on Margie's murder. State of Illinois, guys. I don't, I don't know what goes on here with the judges. But 20, I don't care if he's got 100 years already. It was probably some, maybe it was a plea bargain, you know, maybe it wasn't the judge. But why do you have to, why do you have to give into that? 20 years, first degree murder. I mean, at least for the significance of it. So we got 20 years for Margie's death, whose grave we are approaching right now. 20 years is all. How insulting. She is located right here, and her inscription is part of this, this monument of the Turs family. I see on the left, we see Agnes, 1935 to 2001. I believe that's her mother, of course. And her father, Edward R., 1905 to 1951. And here is Marky's inscription. And the way these are laid out, she is, you know, they are laid out usually here in the order, not the order, but the, um, they're laid out in the position their inscriptions are. I'm going to leave her a flower. So Agnes did did get to see justice 
for her daughter, you know, 20 years, I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure she wasn't thrilled about that, but anyway, the guy's, the guy's sitting there in Statesville right now, south of here, and he is, he's serving his time. And I gotta tell you something, this just makes me ill. You know, you look at a picture of him right now and he's sporting his Harley Davidson beard or, you know, trying to look cool for the other guys in prison. Why should, living the life, I guess, living the life in the country club, three square meals. I'm sure he's watching TV or YouTube. Hey, maybe he's watching us. How do you feel about this, Major? Well, you're gonna die there, buddy. You're gonna die in prison. How do you like that? Anyway, feel bad for the, the Stern family and Roberta's family, the Anderson family. So, to Roberta, Bobby Joe, Anderson, and Margie, Margie Stern, rest in peace, rest in peace.